Um, so first of all, I just want to thank everyone so much for coming and spending their lunch hour with me on a Tuesday. Um, if it is your lunch hour, if you're like me, you kind of just work whenever since the pandemic started and time means nothing anymore, which we'll actually end up talking a little bit about today. But regardless of what you're doing today, thank you so much for coming and spending an hour with me to talk a little bit about anarchy. So I'm going to keep my own part of the discussion down to about an hour, or sorry, about half an hour, um, because I know everyone's a little bit zoomed out and doesn't probably really want to hear me talk for a full 60 minutes. And I also really want to be sure that there's enough time for questions at the end. And um, and also just during the chat itself, when I'm talking, if anyone has a question, please feel free to just pop it in the chat um, or just have something they want to say. Because really, you know, ideally, I'd have liked this to be a really interactive and in-person discussion, but I'd like to replicate that experience in the virtual space as best as possible. Um, okay. So for those that don't know, my name is Lainey Lennox, and I'm a PhD candidate at Ulster University School of Applied Policy and Social Sciences. I'm not going to spend a ton of time today talking about my own PhD research, because that's really not the point of this. But I do just want to give a very brief overview, uh, just to give you an idea of kind of how I got involved with anarchic thought and theory and really came to the understanding that I'm going to share with you today. So my research focuses on democratization of societies that have been affected by conflict and divide. And my definition of democracy is informed by anarchic thought and theory. And so when I say democracy, I'm not referring to the type of democracies that actually um, exist. So the kind of representative democracies that we have, but more so an idea of what, a, what democratic practice could be. Um, so, so Oftentimes, the term direct democracy and anarchism are used hand in hand, and I'm going to use them hand in hand a bit during this presentation. Um, so in my research, I think about direct democratic practice as something that can be built and applied um, in a grassroots community centric or bottom up way, rather than thinking of democratic practice as something that happens solely within, within uh, political structures and top down governmental pro processes. So really, during the course of this discussion, I want us to think imaginatively about, about democracy um, and how we can think of it as something that can happen more in our everyday lives and not just within political structures. Um, so when I talk about anarchy, I am talking about the sense of direct, dem uh, direct democracy and sort of direct democratic action, which is something I'll explain in a little bit more detail later in the presentation. Um, I know not everyone here may be familiar with what anarchy is as a political ideology, so I just want to give a very brief and simplified definition to be sure that we're all on the same page going forward. So at the heart of anarchist um, ideology and theory is this belief in decentralizing power um, and distributing power sort of even evenly amongst people that make up communities or societies so that everyone has an equal, say, an equal way to participate within the structures that are meaningfully influencing their lives. And I'm, I'm specifically avoiding the word state in this definition and using words community and societies because anarchist theory does, um, does try to think about how communities and societies can be structured outside of the state structures that we, uh, that we know today. So an easy way to think about about decentralization is to just kind of think of what a traditional monarchy is um, and kind of think of decentralized power and anarchy is the opposite of that. So in a monarchy, the king and queen, you know, just in a traditional monarchy are the heads of state and they hold the power um, centrally. So they are the central decision makers. And so essentially anarchy is just kind of the opposite of that, creating opportunity for community decisions to be made via consensus groups and shared action. So today I want to talk a bit about how, um, how this understanding has started to inform my life in a more personal way um, related to my habits and how I conduct my life just in, in a day-to-day -day way. So the photo that I used to provoke this event and the one that you can see on the title card there um, is a photo that I took while doing my field work in Germany of a sign that says the future was better in the present. 
It's a photo I've reflected on a lot over the past year. Um, my fieldwork focused on German memorial culture and understanding how engaging with the past um, within a nonlinear understanding can help us build more inclusive futures by providing a framework for reflection and for considering how the events and structures of the past inform our present realities. And that's how we imagine and make decisions regarding the future. Um, so, you know, at the time I took the photo, I was just taking it because it kind of reminded me generally of the sense of nonlinear and deconstructed approach to time. Um, and I took the photo like, in February of 2020, right before our sense, um, our collective sense of the future changed drastically. And, you know, over the course of this past year in which the kind of futures that we planned for were essentially robbed. Sorry, I'm just saying, um, Sarah, it's like, oh, sorry, I thought she said that there, right? She's telling me that, it, can everyone see the see me okay? I'm not sharing the PowerPoint yet. So if you can't see the presentation, that's that's okay. Okay, okay, just double checking. Um, yeah, so anyway, what I was saying is that I've come to view this photo in a really different way over the course of the past year, just in the context of how we've had to really start to drastically think differently about our futures. Um, so now I think of this phrase, the future is better in the present, as meaning that we move into a better version of our futures, um, not when we think of the future as a faraway plan, but when we kind of think of it as hope itself and as the societies and communities we imagine wanting um, that we can kind of begin to live out through our actions we decide to take daily. The unexpected sense of space and slowness that opened up in my life during the first lockdown allowed me to reconsider my future and to meaningfully think about the future I wanted and to embody that um, within my daily life. Um, so what I mean by this is I wanna be able to imagine the type of future that I wanted and to act in my daily life in a way that was in accordance with that hope for future. And again, I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but we're gonna go into that a bit more later. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead now and start, if you'll just bear with me a moment, sharing the presentation. Um, sorry, when I had to restart my computer earlier, um, things are kind of lost in the mix. Um, sorry about this. Um, well, I'll go ahead and explain why I'm pulling this up. Um, has anyone here used Mentimeter before? It's a tool for just engaging virtually. Um, in an anonymous way. If people in the chat can just let me know if they've used it before, if it's something that they're familiar with. Okay, so it looks like a few people have and a few people haven't. So basically what Mentimeter is, is a way for you to, okay, can everyone see it? Okay. Okay, so So Mentimeter is a way for you to engage anonymously um, via, um, via an online tool. So basically, I'm going to ask you to, um, once this loads, can everyone see the, the presentation OK? Okay. Okay, sorry, this is taking a second. Um, but basically what Mentimeter is, is you're gonna have to go to mentimeter.com and then, or just menti.com. Oh, this is, hold on, sorry. Oh, just full of issues today. Um, really sorry, I'm just realizing this is a practice version of the presentation. Um, but basically, I, I'm going to get you to, to um, tell me a word or like a phrase that you think of when you hear the word anarchy. Um, when I first planned this talk, I intended um, to just kind of launch directly into hopefully an interactive discussion about, um, about anarchism, but it, it's sort of when I was watching the um, the coverage of the the January six 
insurrection um, at Capitol Hill and the way that the word anarchy was used, it kind of occurred to me that people might have um, some different associations with the word. And I just kind of want to get a gauge on where everyone is at um, because, you know, I don't know who else in the audience. There may be people here that do consider themselves anarchists and are very familiar with anarchist ideas. There may be people that are familiar with anarchist ideas um, but don't consider themselves anarchists. There may be people that um, that kind of have heard the word but may even be a little bit wary of it. So I just wanted to give a chance for everyone once this loads to, um, okay, I don't know why it's doing this, <laughs> sorry. I, um, okay, you know what we're gonna do instead is why I don't, <laughs> instead of using Minty because it's, uh, it is not wanting to cooperate. Why don't people just in the chat, um, let, just give me like a word or a phrase that, that you think of whenever you hear the word anarchy. Um, sorry, now I'm happy. Um, yeah, if people just in the chat, okay, so I'm getting solidarity, self-organization, collective, mutual aid, mutual aid and freedom, um, distributed democracy, opposition, uh, stateless. Okay, cool. Cool. Uh, real democracy. Yeah, cool. So if people, again, the, um, if we were able to use Minty, I was going to, um, I was going to have people do this anonymously, so I apologize that that doesn't really seem to be possible today because I did want people to feel free if they did have negative associations with the word to um, to share that. But, um, but yeah, so I appreciate everyone um, everyone doing that. So I just kind of wanted to get a sense of where everyone was coming from with the with the term itself and kind of with ideas around around anarchy. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, I decided to add that part of the presentation. And after seeing the word anarchy, um, how it was being used in the coverage of the January 6th insurrection at the US Capitol. Um, so to show you what I mean, I just pulled a few examples of headlines from, from that day. So from New York Magazine, there was a photo series titled A Day of Anarchy at the Capitol um, from the Telegraph, Carnage and Anarchy, How Donald Trump Sparked America's Day of Shame. Um, and then finally for the Washington Post, um, a day of ceremony descends into anarchy at Capitol Hill. So each of these, each of these, um, these headlines appeared within a day of, of the insurrection. And if you take nothing else away from today, I just hope that, that this presentation kind of gives you a different understanding of anarchy and that if, if you see anarchy kind of being used in this way that you would at least be critical of it and maybe um, challenge how it's being used because really when it's used in headlines like this it's just kind of synonymous with um, you know it's kind of just a colloquial word, use of the word to mean like violent chaos um, and this really felt especially egregious to me in the coverage of the um, the capital Hill instruction by the alt-right because especially considering how anarchy and anarchists have been vilified by the far right um, you know, Donald Trump in the midst of the BLM protests of 2020, um, even at one point suggesting how many Antifa, Antifa labeled as a terrorist organization. And it's worth pointing out that Antifa is not an organization. It's just a word that's been used in anarchist circles for quite some time. Um, you know, as well as the vilification of kind of different anarchic action that occurred during the Black Lives Matter protests of the summer of 2020. Um, so, you know, seeing coverage like this, it, it really seems that anarchists and anarchy are destined to remain um, a bogeyman for those that fear shifts in power and a change in the status quo. I hope today that I can offer a perspective on anarchic practice that is not discussed as much, um, which is kind of the, um, sorry, is not discussed as much, which is just kind of the small everyday actions and the small but significant acts of community building that can both cause um, and create important change and instill hope. So, you know, without at all belittling the, the focus on and um, the focus 
and importance of, pro of protest and louder anarchic action, um, I'd like to focus on and consider an embodied form of commitment to anarchy in everyday life and our daily lived experience. Um, so, you know, without negating the harm that this kind of like uh, fear or this idea of anarchy as boogeyman men causes, I suggest a presentation of anarchic practice for both the skeptical and committed but overwhelmed, one that focuses on considering the importance of daily lives and habits and feeling empowered to meaningfully change the status quo through a rejection of traditional linear thinking and progress um, and a practiced and intentional slowness. So by imagining the futures we wish to see and beginning to live our daily lives as if they already exist, we begin to meaningfully challenge existing structures and live more empowered, liberated lives. Um, okay. So now I can kind of get back to the presentation itself. Sorry that there's been so many kind of different technical issues today. Uh, so to attach a visual to this kind of nonlinear consideration of the past, present, and future, I included another photo from my time in Germany. Uh, this photo was a temporary exhibit set up as part of the 30th Mauerfall Festival, which celebrated the 30th anniversary of the opening of the Berlin Wall. So um, I think it's just a really interesting visual for talking about this kind of nonlinear approach to time because it looks like a traditional, a traditional timeline, but it's actually a map of the U5 subway line in Berlin. Um, and, you know, which each dot is, is a stop along the line. So you can kind of see the right side is the first stop there um, and so on. And surrounding each of the stops are descriptions and photos of different, different historical events from Berlin's past that are related to, to that place, that stop on the line. And it's not, you know, the the Marafal Festival was focused on Cold War era Berlin, but these, these different historical points are from all different periods in Berlin's history, including earlier in the 20th century. So I think this nonlinear engagement with the past um, really asked those looking at the exhibit to consider how events from different periods in Berlin's history relate to one another, as well as to present day Berlin. Um, because, you know, a person looking at the exhibit would of course have to be standing in present day Berlin. So I would really like us all to imagine that an exhibit like this could also include events that haven't happened yet, events from the future. So, because then we could see how the present and our current actions relate not only to different points in the past, but into the futures that come to be. There was another event that I attended as part of the Marfa Festival that introduced a really interesting thought exercise about thinking of the future in this way. So the event was about Berlin in 2050. Um, as if that city and that time already existed. So then it was asking the, the panelists and those in the audience to think about what actions we'd have to take in the coming decades to reach the type of Berlin we'd like to see in 2020. And it's this kind of nonlinear thinking I suggest can be a really useful tool in planning daily actions in our own lives. Um, excuse me. So now I wanna go into a bit more detail about what I mean by direct democracy. Um, and suggest that this nonlinear, the direct democracy itself is a nonlinear process. And then in fact, um, a key component of the decentralization of power that anar anarchy calls for is nonlinear thinking. So I get this understanding of democracy from a few different theorists, um, you know, primarily the famous anarchist thinker that sadly passed um, this in 2020, David Graeber, um, and as well as two political theorists, Jacques Rancé and Chantal Mouffe. So Graeber, as an approach to understanding dem direct democracy that's focused on uh, consensus building and making, making uh, decisions as a group. And um, in which member has an equal voice. So that's as opposed to kind of the representative based democratic systems that, that we live in. And then Jacques Rancé considers democracy as the widening of the public sphere, which in my understanding means the widening of the widening of opportunity for kind of the average individual citizen to participate within the structures that that affect their lives. And then Chantal Mouffe understands democracy, sort of the ideal practice of democracy is an agonistic sy system which institutionalizes dissent. Um, so 
and the way MOVE is thinking about it is sort of that democracy is this ongoing conversation about what our best possible societies could be. And that as soon as we close this conversation, the democratic process itself is over because participation closes. So in that way, it's inherently nonlinear because it's this ongoing process rather than um, some sort of linear process that's trying to seek some kind of a conclusion. And again, they're all talking about political structures, but I want to think about democratic action as it kind of applies just in our, in our daily lives and actions and also in how we can do community action outside of political structures. So to explain this a bit more, I have a couple of graphs. Um, so this first graph is, I wanna be clear, I'm not saying that this is how I think representative democracy, democracies work, but it's kind of, I think how we envision like an ideal representative democracy. So, you know, that's the most common type of democracy where, where we elect representatives to speak on our behalf in, in the voting process. So on the y-axis at the top, I have a smiley face that just is representing basically, you know, positive and good things happening in society. At the bottom of the y-axis is a frowning face just representing the opposite. Now on the x-axis, I have a clock representing time. So just representing like the sense of linearity. And then the purple line is representative of the democratic process itself. And so, you know, we tend to think of this, this kind of like our elected representatives are speaking on our behalf and things are trekking along you know, in this kind of linear and clean way towards a, a, general, a general societal good. So what I'm arguing for and what I'm talking about is a much more direct and participatory democratic process. And again, we don't need to think of this as just happening within governing structures. But as you can see, again, the y-axis is the same top, you know, hopefully we're still progressing in this general good direction. And, but then on the x-axis, I've replaced the, the stopwatch with a feedback loop just to represent, represent an ongoing process. And then the purple line, once again, is representing the democratic process itself. And as you can see, it's much messier, but I'm arguing that it needs to have this kind of nuance and fluidity to be more inclusive and participatory. Okay. So, when direct democracy and democratic action is discussed, it tends to be done in overarching terms that I think can seem overwhelming or detached from our lives as individuals. It can seem like democracy is kind of something that we live within and something that happens to us and that we kind of, in a very, um, you know, structured and, and uh, like kind of inconsistent way, participate in, in small ways um, and that it has very little meaning in our daily lives. So although I considered myself an anarchist for a few years at the start of the pandemic, this had never had any meaningful implication in my day-to-day -day life um, because I spent a lot of time thinking and writing about anarchism academically without seriously considering what this means for me in terms of action. Um, you know, actions I took in my day-to-day -day life in large and small ways. So, you know, how I bought my food, conversations I had with people, um, et cetera. The sudden slowness that I experienced in the early days of the pandemic, um, which in many ways was the inability to act, at least in the ways that I had before suddenly allowed me the space to reflect on my own ideology and how I can make this a more meaningful part of my life. So a really important aspect of this reflection was the pause and the expectation to produce that existed in the early days of the pandemic, of course, for those that were non-essential workers. Um, you know, unfortunately, this leniency um, and ex around expectation of production about a year into the pandemic um, is not there in the same way, but that's perhaps a discussion for another day. Um, but this pause made me realize that I was so focused on the production of anarchist ideas within my own work and my own academic research that I hadn't really given myself the space to consider, um, to consider how they could be applied in my own life. Um, so this idea led me to consideration of Paulo Bruno's idea of engaged withdrawal which is just kind of this idea that deciding to remove ourselves and as far as we can from the structures that that we don't agree with is is an act of action in itself even if it sort of feels like an action um so it this allowed me to think not only of action of is that which i do but that slowing down in and of itself to take time to participate um in community gardens or to spend more time walking to local shops or spend more time going to, to no waste shops rather than you know what I had usually done which was buying 
um, buying big supermarket shops and getting them delivered was important was as important of a political act as something like organizing or participating in a protest. Um, again, not belittling those actions at all, but just that these are small daily actions that we can take. So Paula Verna also said that, um, quote, nothing appears as en enigmatic today as what it means to act, end quote. Thinking about how we might act and how we might meaningfully live according to our values, um, whatever those might be, is of course an ongoing process that's often riddled with, with confusion and lack of clarity. What I'm hoping to offer today is kind of a sense of bite-sized anarchism and to suggest that there's an immense power in considering how we can apply democratic ideals outside of political structures and in our own daily lives. And, you know, in, and also to offer something perhaps for those that are skeptical of the philosophy or political ideology as a whole, but they can find something that resonates with them in the smaller consideration of anarchic practice. One that encompasses small participation in mutual aid projects, for example, or, you know, growing your own vegetables, which I kind of have included um, a picture of myself attempting to do. And, and um, just creating space in your life to be slower and more intentional is important political acts. Um, in discussing participation in political movements, David Graeber argues that once an individual meaningfully starts to consider that actions can be taken to actually change the course of our futures, that this sort of hope or possibility never really goes away. Um, he calls this a transformative outbreak of imagination, essentially that once something is imagined, it can't be unimagined. So without in any way belittling or negating the pain and suffering that this pandemic has caused, um, I suggest that this can, this can kind of be a moment of transformative, a transformative outbreak of imagination for us um, as we begin to consider what the world will look like as we recover from this crisis, there's no normal that we're obliged to return to um, and that we really can create the space to kind of imagine new ways of being that begin to take shape in our daily lives and embodied experiences. So thank you all for listening to that. And I really appreciate everyone kind of uh, sticking around through the, uh, through the technical issues as well. So we have about half an hour. If anyone wants to ask any questions, you can pop them in the chat or if you, um, yeah, sorry, I'm just kind of reading some of the, the chats that I missed. So, um, so yeah, if anyone has a question they want to pop in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself and speak, or sorry, unmute yourself and speak, that's great as well. Um, I'll just answer one from Steve-O. Um, saying, isn't the Ubon system a loop? So a cyclical timeline. Um, yeah, and more so, um, yeah, thanks so much, Jim. Um, yeah, more so, I think just, just that was just kind of a visual to think about, to think about how we can kind of approach thinking about time and, and in that case, history in a nonlinear way. Um, so just kind of, because it looked like a traditional timeline, but it had, it wasn't linear, so it had different parts of the past arranged around around a place rather than kind of around time. If that makes sense. Um, let's see. Did you have something like ancient Greece in mind when talking about direct democracy? Um, no, to be honest, not really. It's it's something ancient Greece and some of the political theory that I read does does come up, but it's more so, when I'm talking about direct democracy, I'm more so just thinking about something that doesn't exist um, on a large scale yet, if that makes sense. So something that would be, you know, kind of radically inclusive, much, much more so than, um, than what ancient, ancient Greece had. Uh... What literature would you recommend on direct democracy and what other practices could be implemented in our daily lives? Sure, so I don't know how familiar everyone is with David Graeber. I can even maybe just put his name in the chat. I would really recommend any anything by him. And he did he did sadly pass um, this last year, but I, I find him really accessible and Sorry, just putting his name in the chat. Really accessible and easy to read. It's not too. It, he is a theorist, but it's not. It's not kind of too 
academic sounding, which I think none of, no one really, <laughs> really appreciates. Um, yeah, so David, there's there's tons by David Graeber. Um, a really short one is Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology, which is is about anthropology, but it, he does talk about democracy in there as well. It looks like a, a few other people are, are making recommendations as well. Anyone else have any questions? Anyone want to unmute themselves? Lenny, what's your view of the fact that that uh, you know many people uh, are so split and and that political parties are divisive, so it creates splits in society where you don't have uh, everyone gathering round one one focal point or one aim or whatever. Oh, so just just my view on kind of fragmentation and political parties. Yeah. Is that um well by caused by political parties. Right, right. Because they each have different views. Right. Um yeah, so I think, you know, I think that's why I kind of wanted to be to really emphasize that when I'm talking about direct democratic action and kind of the potential it could have, that I think we we really can think about that outside of the political systems that currently exist and outside of governmental structures, because I think there's a lot of power in community building and in thinking about how democracy, how that's also an act of democracy and how democracy can function within those spaces so that we're not, you know, because I think it can feel very depressing and we can feel kind of beholden to the to the political systems that we have. But I do think there's potential to creatively think about democratic action outside of that. Um, so I hope that I hope that answered your question. I don't. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just have a couple more. Okay, those aren't questions. Um, Are there any more questions? Um, oh, let's see. So from Catherine. Um, okay. Okay, so Catherine is asking, um, she said, if anyone is interested in bartering, I love how it takes us out of everyday capitalism, even in some ways every now and then. I trade my art and design. Does anyone here know of bartering groups projects? Does anyone? I, I personally, don't. Um, although I did actually just download an app. This isn't exactly the same thing, but just download an app called Olio, which where people um, get rid of things that they're not using anymore for free. And it's not bartering, but um, but anyway, it's a it's a app where people get rid of food and other things they're not using for free. Okay, cool. So. Hey, Lenny, we have a question from V. Um, she okay. asked, they ask, how do you get to make anarchism your focus in academia? I would be really interested in that. Yeah, so I guess the, the short answer to that question is that um, when I proposed my project, it wasn't a focus at all. Um, it, it's just kind of something I came to because I think it was probably just, just a natural place to go with the way that I was talking about. Again, I, I focus on memorialization essentially in societies that are that are that have experienced conflict and divide I was kind of you know going and talking about nonlinear thinking and deconstructive time and and ended up thinking about memorialization itself as a democratic process and you know I think I just kind of it, it probably honestly accidentally more than anything else happened to start reading a lot of anarchist theory because it was something I was personally interested in and it was just a a really good, a really good fit for the other things that I was doing. But I think, you know, there are, um, there are anar groups of anarchist academics. So there's the Anarchist Studies Network, for example, I don't know if you're, if um, you're already kind of in a university system, but there's, you know, if you follow, 
um, if you kind of start following different anarchist things on Twitter, they'll they'll come up. But I know, yeah, the Anarchist Studies Network, which I can actually put in the chat as well. And, and then off Borough University, I hope that I'm gonna spell correctly, tends to do a lot of anarchist kind of work as well. But there are a group of anarchist academics out there. Are there any more questions? Anyone else wanna uh, wanna unmute themselves? Anything? Lenny, uh, Hugh McDermott here again. How would you describe a, a democratic system where a, less than one percent, or even smaller than that, people select the people who are elected to government? And uh, maybe maybe forty percent of the people who are in the electorate then uh, select the people who who become the government. And on top of that, you have many of the electorate that don't even vote. So how would you describe that sort of democracy? Yeah. So I think um, if I'm if I'm catching you right, that's just a representative democracy, um, you know. So where where people vote for people to to speak on their on their behalf and act on their behalf, essentially, which is, of course, the the most kind of common common democracy that we have that we have now. Um, and you know, I think I think that's what that's what you're saying. So and of course, not not everyone not everyone votes within those for. For various reasons. Um, Would you not describe it as an autocracy? Could you, could you maybe just, just repeat it again? Well, if less than 1% of the people select the people who are elected to government, right? Mm -hmm. And then maybe 60% of the people vote for those people. Mm -hmm. And those people who form government maybe and maybe get 40% uh, of the votes uh, and they form a government. Uh, how is this representative? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I would agree with you that it's not particularly representative, which is why I kind of advocate more direct democratic action, um, because I just think there's there's a limit to how representative the, the types of political structures we have now can be. Um, and, you know, per, yeah, so I, I I agree that, that the representative democracies as as we have them now are not not particularly representative for for a variety of reasons. Thank you. See a lot of people in the chat talking about different kind of Skillshare things and bartering things. So that's it's really cool. It's cool to see. something I hope things like this can get bigger kind of as we hopefully knock on wood come out of this pandemic in the in the near future. Okay, so I see a question from Matthew. How do we combat the bad PR we end up with it as anarchist um anarcho-curious people? 
Yeah, Matthew, so that's that's something I kind of wanted to touch on today, and I, I don't know how, how well it did it. Um, but I think, you know, I think people tend to kind of be, if they're not familiar with the ideas, wary of, of the word anarchy even. And that's kind of why I wanted it to be, want to talk, talk about how it can be reimagined just because, just as this kind of daily, daily practice. And again, not, not to belittle things like protests and movements and marches, but those are kind of the more visible parts of anarchy. And I think, you know, I, I think just kind of consistent, you know, and, and daily engaged community action, because, you know, I don't think a ton of people are going to be are going to feel like there's there's a lot to argue with with, the, with things like a community garden or, or mutual aid projects. Um, so I think I think maybe just you know, this may be kind of a complicated way to answer the question, but I, I think maybe just kind of continued community engagement and being being vocal about you know these things are are anarchy too, um, and this is kind of the the daily practice and application of it. Yeah, so I see Steve says he came across anarchy as a as a punk buzzword, but there's a lot more to it. Yeah, and I, that's actually kind of something I wanted to mention as well, because I think people often come across it in these very kind of specific contexts and specific circles and, you know, maybe even have kind of, there's like the stereotypical anarchist that's a punk and wears all black, I say as I am wearing all black, <laughs> but, um, but just kind of, just kind of the sense that, um, that there is like a, like a depth to it and, and, and maybe just if if we can find ways to talk about that more and to talk about the different things that kind of make different facets of it. Um, are there any more questions? Uh, there's another comment from V who's asking, have you ever wondered, uh, have you ever read, sorry, any existential philosophy? As there seems to be a link between the views of that philosophy and anarchism sometimes not an existent, existential anarchism? Um, well, I mean, to be honest, I have not read any existential literature probably in about 10 years, so it's not not super fresh in my mind. Um, that being said, I do I do use something called existential anthropology, um, which, you know, I think in terms of just thinking about non-linear linearity and, um, and kind of a, a sense of creating uh, creating who we are and creating the realities that we live in. I think there, there probably is, um, is a lot of overlap there. I've never come across anything dubbed as existential anarchism, um, but we would be very interested to, to hear more about it. Again, you know, just haven't, haven't read any real existential literature in probably about 10 years. So um, that, yeah, would be, would be very interested to hear more about that. Got a couple of questions from Liz. Uh, who says, unfortunately, she missed the beginning, but have you uh, been speaking about people's assemblies? And in her ex limited experience, they're a great way of involving everybody in decision making for activism and asks if there's any other comments related mm -hmm. to that. Yeah, so I have never uh, participated in a people's assembly and don't, don't really have, um, have any experience with it. But I think in terms of just ideas around consistent consensus groups and consensus building, I I do think they are a great way of involving everybody. And, you know, I think the general, uh, I guess, criticism of them is that it takes a long time to make decisions that way. Um, but I think the, the kind of, I think a good way to describe what they are and how they can be really useful is that better, better decisions can kind of be made in the long term if you're not just kind of, in a way, forced to decide between two things. But if you, if you can decide within a consensus in a group and then come to kind of a better understanding or a better way of doing something that it's not kind of the quick and easy way to do it, but long-term is probably the more sustainable. And so I hope, I hope that answered, answered your question. Uh, were there, were there any more? Nothing's popped in so far, but there are a few interesting comments uh, and conversations happening in the chat. Okay. Um, so in 
response, Yvonne has said, in party politics, the party always comes first ahead of providing for the people. Party politics spend so much time on jockeying for positions, former cliques and the, within the party, giving your mates plum rules, for example, and lobbying on behalf of already powerful companies, industries, etc. Recent PPE contract uh, revelations are a good example and an of this awful waste of money. Um, yeah. And then V has very kindly popped a uh, link to some existential anarchism into the chat window as well. Ah, uh, thanks very much, V. Thanks very much, V. Something that I'll definitely, definitely spend some time looking into today. Um, yeah, it looks like there's, you know, you're giving, you're only giving me a bunch of different ways to kind of think about this. I see Steve has said something about um, introducing the end user into the design process um, as early as possible. Yeah, yeah, um, I think that's a really interesting way to think about it as well. We've got a question from Matty. Okay. And forgive my pronunciations here of have you looked into ontology uh dorita or fisher yeah interestingly enough matthew i think about a week ago i just encountered that word for the first time in um in a book called the walker by matthew beaumont and he was talking about um oh am i going to remember he was talking about kind of the the space buildings take up in a city and whether place kind of has this um like like if what a place was kind of uh leaves a remnant or kind of has a sense of what the place becomes so anyway that's just to say i'm not that familiar with it um and i'd be interested to kind of know what what connections you're you're thinking about in terms of in terms of this talk um matthew if you wanted to just put that in the chat or if, if you wanted to say something about it yeah it was just sort of the the idea of the hauntology sort of and I'm always bad at describing this, which is really bad because it's a section of my PhD. <laughs> um, but it's the idea that images of the past haunt the future. So you're kind of compelled mm -hmm. by the ghosts of the past for a particular future, whether or not they may have actually wanted it. So the kind of the disjoint in time where you're being dragged into the future by something in the past mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And I mean, sort of in a Northern Ireland, Ireland case, there's books like Ghosts of the Psalm by John Evershed that discusses and uh, Remembering and Forgetting 1916 by um, Rebecca Graffrey. So it's just sort of the, the idea, I, I'm not really sure where it fits in, it's just the idea of the time element being committed into mm -hmm. it. It's always interesting, people involved in memory studies kind of always end up with these disjointed ideas of time, because mm -hmm. the past is never yeah. about the past, it's always about the future or the now. So it's just sort of just throwing that uh, jumble of thoughts at you, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, I, um, no, I think that's really interesting, and it does relate to relate to uh, more, I guess, more so my PhD work. But I, but I think, I think that's why I kind of got interested. And in, so, as I said, I think earlier in the presentation, my my PhD work is really focused on how, just as you're saying, Matthew, like how the past informs the future and how as you're saying I, I kind of I like that that image of like a ghost or a haunting because I think that's why that's why I, I think it's so important to, to engage with the past and of course and of course the past is a constructed thing as well and it reflects on our realities of our present um, but in I think the kind of different approach to time that that I kind of came to in the course of planning for this presentation and thinking about it was also really thinking about about the present. So I felt like I spent so much time thinking about how the past relates to the future that I wasn't thinking about as much about how kind of the present and the, the daily lives that we live, which of course is also related to the past, um, affect the futures that we move into in a way as well. Um, and as you said, anyone that does memory studies stuff, I think ends up with this nonlinear time kind of strangeness. So, um, yeah, so thank you. That's something that I'll definitely look into more as well. Um, okay, are there any more questions or comments? We still got a few minutes. 
Yes, uh, so Stephen has written into the chat here. He said, I am excited about how marginalized groups, examples such as disabled people could benefit from anarchist ideas, but how do we ensure that marginalized groups aren't simply spoken over within a direct democratic system? The current state does not have limited unsatisfactory protections for various people. Can similar protections be guaranteed within a smaller scale direct democratic system? Yeah, so, you know, I think, I guess, I guess I think the key to anything like that, um, and of course, you know, being, I guess, being wary of guaranteeing anything, but the, the, the key to anything like that is, is to really keep the kind of strong community focus. And again, you know, I'm thinking about, I don't necessarily think about kind of overarching political structures when I'm talking about direct democracy. I do think more about kind of community, I guess, work and community systems. And I think, I think really, having strong communities and kind of ensuring that the they're not individualistic and that and that everyone's just kind of simply concerned with their own their own kind of limited and individual progress. Um, I think that's that's kind of how that's kind of what I mean when I'm talking about nonlinear democracy as well because it's kind of constantly engaging within the community and being tapped into the community's needs and being tapped into every everyone in the community's needs, if if that makes sense. I hope that answered the question. Um, I know I didn't specifically speak about the disabled people um, within that, but kind of just the idea that that everyone in the community is is equally important and. So, lots of interesting stuff going on in the chat. I'm just having a chance to look at. Uh, are there any more kind of comments and questions that within the last few minutes I can I can answer or speak to? Um, actually, just briefly, something that I just thought of when just thinking about the, the kind of disabled issue again, there is something called um, like a like a realm of theory called crip time, and it kind of focuses how restructuring the way we think of progress within people's lives uh, is kind of how disabled people have to approach have to approach time, and that that's kind of a process of of decentralizing power if we if we think differently about progress and about how people's lives progress in a, in a non-normative way. So that was just something I, I thought of in relation to that question. Um, okay, we still have a few minutes of... Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Molly. The Weird and the Eerie, I like that title. So I'll definitely, I'll definitely look into that. Any more questions or anyone that wanna wanna unmute themselves and ask anything? Um, yep, so V has popped another comment into the chat for us. So mm -hmm. could you conceive anarchism as a form of critical thinking in the sense of the individual not falling uh, with preordained political groups, but voluntarily and critically choosing their own way, further extended um, into other realms, such as in knowledge in general, such as, and I apologize, epistemology. Yeah, so I, I do think, you know, I think, I guess kind of much like I said with, with democracy, that I think we, we can think of anarchism as kind of more than just, just a, an idea about political structures. And um, yeah, in that sense, I think can certainly, certainly engage with it as a form of critical thinking. Um, yeah, so voluntarily, sorry, I'm just kind of reading it to get it, to get a sense of it as well. I'm voluntarily and critically choosing their own way. Yeah, so I think I think that's kind of an interesting point about a different way to think about individualism as well, right? So 
I think within, within anarchist thought, it's um, kind of this idea that we're both more community-based, but that everyone kind of has more, more freedom to, to determine their own lives, if, if that makes sense. So it's less individualistic and in that it's very community-oriented, but then giving people a sense, um, I guess, as you're saying, to critically choose their own way, if, if that makes sense. And, and yeah, in terms of thinking about it as an epistemology, um, I guess, sorry. Um, yeah, can see as an epistemology itself. I guess what I would say about that is probably thinking about decentralized knowledge. So just kind of the idea, if we're gonna like, take an anarchist approach to epistemology, so just the idea that knowledge coming from different sources, that there's not a hierarchy of knowledge, so that, that we're not kind of overly centralizing academic voices and, and things like that, that community voices and community knowledge are, are on equal footing. Okay, so we just have a bit more time. Is there any kind of any final question or comment? Well, um, thank you all for, for joining me today again, for taking an hour out on your, on your Tuesday afternoon to, to spend some time uh, talking about anarchy. And thank you for, for making it such a really interesting kind of question and comment session as well. And I can see that there's a ton of different interesting conversations going on in the chat. Um, and I'll definitely follow up with some of the reading recommendations as well. I'm very much looking forward to that. So. So if, if there aren't any more questions, just we'll say thank you very much once again to everyone. And uh, yeah, hope you enjoy the rest of your week and the rest of the Imagine Festival.